So I think at this point what we'll do is pause for a moment to uh, think about Toynbee's model because um, Toynbee's model is, is, is pretty good too and uh, it's pretty ingenious and it's worth uh, rubbing up against Spangler's to keep the two models in mind as we proceed through Spangler. Uh, Toynbee's is, is, is pretty, pretty extensive. Originally he put out uh, his book which is called A Study of History in 12 volumes all during the 1930s so it was a massive undertaking. I read the first couple of those uh, and they're quite good. They are well worth reading. It's, that's one of my K2's that I want to climb at some point. Um, if I can afford to buy them, I mean they're now they're really expensive. Try, to try to get a whole set of all 12 of those is uh, it's like a thousand dollars out of my reach. Um, but I do want to go through them at, at some point, like, I, like we're doing here with Spangler. Um, so he writes this huge 12-volume uh, thing, and then this guy named uh, D.C. Somerville uh, did a two-volume abridgment that is very good, very readable. Uh, I think Toynbee was satisfied with it, too. He, he appreciated what Somerville did for him. There's another abridgment, though, that Toynbee himself did near the end of his career in the 1970s. It's just called A Study of History, and it's a large illustrated version that where he went in and just rewrote the whole thing as a single book, um, and that one I did a, a Google Play series on, chapter by chapter. Um, that is a very good, it, it, it's very revised, a lot of different ideas in that one that exist from what he originally did in the 12-volume study of history. But it's the 12-volume study of history's model that I want to go through here. Um, now, Toynbee sees uh, about 21 different societies, whereas Spangler sees only nine. Toynbee sees 21, but Toynbee has a really bad habit of parsing these societies where he shouldn't. For example, he takes the Hindu civilization and he cuts it in half into uh, an Indic civilization and a Hindu uh, civilization. Uh, that's not correct. There's not two civilizations there. It's just one. It's the Indian civilization. He does the same thing, though, with China. He has the Sinic civilization and the Far Eastern, and it breaks off into the Far Eastern civilization. Uh, so he's got four civilizations there. There's not four. There's only two. Trust me. So <laughs> his, his, his parsings are not correct. He also breaks off the Babylonic civilization, as he calls it, from the Mesopotamian. That's not correct either. The Babylonians are very much a part of the Sumerian civilization. The Babylonians... Without the Babylonians, we wouldn't even have Sumerian literature. We wouldn't have the Gilgamesh epic. We wouldn't have all kinds of Sumerian literature uh, that the Babylonians inherited and had master uh, genius writers, um, you, you know, storing all this stuff up and these amazing stories. The Sumerian literature, did, there's not much there. They didn't write much down, but the Babylonians took it, restored it, created a universal state. Uh, that's not a separate society. So Toynbee has a bad habit of parsing these societies where, where he shouldn't. But he has a couple of cool ideas that uh, we'll get to here in a second, and Spangler doesn't have. So there's not 21 <laughs> civilizations. I think Spangler has it closer to the mark, 9, 10, 11. So I think Spangler leaves out the Japanese, uh, and he doesn't pay much attention to the Hebrew uh, situation with the, the United Kingdom down to for David to Solomon and then the, the Maccabees. He doesn't pay much attention to that development. Uh, he doesn't pay much attention to the Persians. So there are a few things that he could have added to his model, I think, that would make it more fulsome. Um, so, with regard to uh, Toynbee's model, he absolutely rejects Spengler's determinism. Spengler's a German, and he's coming out of the macrocosmic tradition, the astronomical, astrological tradition of absolute determinism that was governed by priesthoods forever, going way, way back. Um, telling you this will happen because the planets do this, they do that. Uh, not that Spengler has any astrology in him, but he comes out of that tradition, whereas Toynbee comes out of the British Anglo empirical tradition of the Dragon Slayer myth, where the Indo Aryan hero kills the dragon out of his own free will and creates a cosmos out of it and absolutely rejects deterministic models. Uh, so they both have these mythic traditions behind them the Dragon Slayer myth and the myth of uh, absolutely deterministic cosmic cycles. Um, so Toynbee rejects Spengler's determinism, and then he has these seven stages that civilizations go through, not deterministically. It just so happens that it, they've all done this. 
So it might as well be deterministic. I mean, if they've all gone through these seven stages, every single one of them, then I don't see what the difference is. Uh, the first stage is genesis. This is followed by growth, then breakdown, then disintegration. Those are the four key phases which end up creating the universal uh, state, which is the fifth, the universal church, which is the sixth, and a heroic age of barbarian war bands, which is the seventh. So those are the seven distinct stages there. Now, the first stage, Genesis, um, Toynbee has, as we've seen, three different generations of civilization, a first, a second, and a third. And in the first generation, we have uh, the Mesopotamians and the Egyptians. And these civilizations come into being through the reason that they come into being. Now, Toynbee here resorts to causality, whereas Spengler does not. Spengler critiques people who look at things and look for causes, but that's exactly what, how Toynbee proceeds. He proceeds as the, the, the world as nature type of guy, not the world as history, Gertean type of guy. And he says the cause for what brings these high civilizations into being is a challenge and response theory, that there is a challenge presented to these people by a difficult environment that uh, brings out the best in them. It's tough times, make for tough people, so it brings, it brings forth a response. Now, in the case of Egypt, uh, the difficulty was they found themselves in this Delta Valley swamp, basically, which they had to tackle. They had to drain it. They had to build canals, drain it, overcome it. Uh, that was the challenge that brought Egyptian civilization forth into being. With Mesopotamia, the challenge was a resource-poor alluvial plain governed by the Tigris and the Euphrates. There's no natural resources on that plain. There's hardly any trees, uh, no metals. There's, there's nothing there. Uh, it's very resource-poor, so they respond by inventing irrigation and canals and mastering that whole situation, which is the stimulus that brings forth the response that brings forth these two high civilizations, which are the first generation of civilization. Now, the second generation that comes in, which as we have seen comes out of the Indo-Aryan invasions and the civilizations of the Greeks and the Hebrews and the, the Persians, the Hindus, the Chinese, then of course across the board with the Olmecs in Mesoamerica. That, he says that second civilization comes into being not through challenges presented by physical circumstances, but by social circumstances. Uh, the, the, the challenge here is presented by the disintegrating behemoths of those of the first civilization falling apart, and now they respond with the second generation, which comes in, and it's philosophical. This is Carl Jaspers's axial age, where across the board, uh, these thinkers and philosophers start coming in. Some of them are Socratic men, some not. Uh, we get Confucius and Lao Tzu in the Hundred Schools. We get Pythagoras and Plato. We get uh, Yujnavalkya in India. They all start coming into being. And what they all have in common, whether they are Socratic men or not, some are, some aren't, but what they all have in common is a teaching of self-salvation for you, the individual, to find a method, such as Yujnavalkya teaching yoga, to find a method, or uh, let's say Latsu saying, fuck civilization, go off into nature and build your own community, your own cabin, and live in nature, to hell with society. They all have this kind of uh, self-salvation thing that is the response to the official state priesthood religions of the first civilization. Uh, in a way, this is what Ignatan was trying to do. He, on the one hand, he was a Socratic man, but on the other, he was also trying to reject the official state religion of Theban, uh, the Theban cult of Amun, uh, reject it, and to try to create a religion of self-salvation, that each individual could pray to the sun god, which would have multiple arms coming out as emanations, a little bit like Plotinus's emanations that come down from the noose, the one, uh, to, ha to help you. Uh, but each of them is a teacher of, self of a religion of self-salvation that is against the decaying state institutions and priesthoods. The Gilgamesh epic uh, has the same scenario. Gilgamesh rejects the official state religion of Inanna, the worship of Ishtar Inanna, that rejects that cult uh, that was official at the city of Aruk and leaves and goes out looking for his own self-salvation. He's looking for a path toward immortality. He doesn't realize that he's looking for one of these teachers. 
Utnapishtim then is cast in the role of one of these teachers of the second generation of civilization. So this is Tarnby's first phase of Genesis, um, and that's how it works. Now he says that he's got this interesting idea of abortive civilizations and arrested civilizations, where he says that these civilizations are abortive or arrested because the stimulus is too much. The stimulus for certain civilizations is too much, so they can never get over that threshold. He says, like the Eskimo, for instance, uh, could never develop a high civilization because of the difficulty of the Arctic conditions that they find themselves in. And he says, examples of abortive civilizations in the West are uh, the Irish Celtic uh, Christian civilization, uh, which was cut off by the Viking Scandinavian civilization, which themselves were also an abortive civilization. Two abortive civilizations there uh, that simply cut each other down, and that's it. They, they could have been separate civilizations, according to Toynbee. Um, I don't think that's correct, though, actually. That's like he's, what he's doing is dealing with all these elements that go into the making of the West, the far Western Faustian civilization, which required both the Scandinavian Germanic world and the Celtic world, and uh, is sort of and is built out of a sort of fusion of their attitudes with the pseudomorphic overlayer of Christianity on top of it. Uh, I don't think Toynbee quite gets that. He's got this idea, too, of arrested civilizations, like the Polynesians, he says, are an arrested civilization because they did this tour de force of conquering the Pacific. They mapped it out, they conquered it with their canoes, uh, they created this tour de force and it just exhausted them, and then they couldn't do anything further. Easter Island... The story of Easter Island is a classic example of this, where they're building their gods, uh, and they deforest the whole place, and there's nothing left, so the whole thing just ends up being a, an arrested civilization that never got off the ground. Because he's thinking in terms of causality here. So some of these work, some don't, but he's th Spengler would anathematize him and say, you're thinking in terms of cause and effect here, like a scientist would. That's not how these societies work, would be Spengler's response. So that's... Genesis. Now, with growth, societies grow, according to Toynbee, because there is a creative minority that undergoes a process of withdrawal and return. Um, this is just like Joseph Campbell's model of the hero separation, initiation, return, which I'm pretty sure he, he took here from Toynbee. He did read Toynbee and refers to him in The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Uh, Paul, for instance, goes out into the deserts he gets lost for a while out in the deserts in Arabia, goes through a very difficult time, then comes back to the society and writes all his letters, which are the earliest Christian documents. He basically creates Christian, the, the nucleus of Christian theology uh, as a result of that withdrawal and return. And uh, lots of individuals have done this process of Christ himself going out into the desert uh, for 40 days. He's out there. That's a withdrawal. Then he comes back with his message uh, to society with his vision. So what happens, what makes a society grow is that the creative minority uh, is built of great men, he's got a sort of great man theory here, who have all gone out, undergone an ordeal, survived it, and come back with a message, and they create a creative minority which the uncreative majority imitates. They like it so much, it has so much charm and uh, fascination uh, that they imitate it, and uh, the imitation of the, of the uncreative uh, majority of the creative minority stimulates the society and everybody wants to copy it so there's a mimesis process that goes on in the growth phase of the civilization but then after these two phases of growth we get to break down and this is also called a time of troubles uh, the first interregnum in Egypt is a time of troubles uh, after one the, the old kingdom is up and running for a thousand years before it hits it's time of troubles, and there's social war, chaos, civil war. Uh, that's the breakdown, the time of troubles. Uh, same thing with Athens and Sparta. The Greeks are going along just fine after the Persian Wars and their victory over the Persians. Then they hit this bump with Athens and Sparta uh, wanting to fight, and it's a fratricidal conflict that essentially tears the society apart and lays the foundation for the coming of the Macedonians with Alexander. Um, the Chinese have a time of troubles, too. In the spring and autumn period, about 600 uh, B.C., they, they start hitting social uh, civil wars and conflicts between the feudal... Uh, it's a feudal conflict between various aristocracies uh, contending for uh, to try to 
uh, make all the other societies uh, worship them and bow to them, and it gives way to the breakdown uh, and produces the school of a, th- of, of, uh, a thousand thinkers, of whom only a few are left because of the burning of the books. We've only got the writings of Confucius, Motsu, Lao Tzu, Chuang Tzu, and a few others. Um, and this is a great period, this hundred schools period, hundred schools, not thousands. This hundred schools period is a great period of all of these mandarins coming forth. But Nietzsche says, he has a little line in his notebooks where he says, a preponderance of mandarins in a society is a sign that something has gone wrong. So it's not a sign of health. It's a sign that something has gone wrong just as when you get sick, the intellect wakes up and begins to analyze your body. Why am I sick? What's going on? What's happening? That's what these guys represent in the hundred schools in the time of the breakdown period. Now what happens is that um, in the breakdown, the creative minority that everyone in the growth period had been imitating now becomes a dominant minority and instead of uh, commanding imitation, now it rules by force uh, and begins to disaffect the society, uh, which now begins to form an internal proletariat which is a disaffected uh, group of people who begin to secede from the body social because they're disillusioned with the leadership of the dominant minority. And there's an external proletariat, which is the barbarian war bands who are waiting at the gate, constantly putting pressure on the civilization. So things are breaking down, uh, and then we get to the disintegration period where the whole thing breaks up. And these three units, the dominant minority, the internal proletariat and the external proletariat all begin to separate out uh, in the period of disintegration and produce uh, a particular institution. The dominant minority produces a universal state which is ruled by force. In China this is Qin Shi Huangdi coming in and unifying all of China. In India this is Ashoka coming in about the same time, 200 BC, unifying all of India by force before he converts uh, to, to Buddhism. Um, and in Rome, this is the victory, about 200 BC, the victory of the Romans over the Carthaginians uh, in the Punic Wars, which then lays the foundations for the coming of the Roman Empire. Uh, the dominant minority then creates this universal state, while meanwhile, the internal proletariat begins to secede from the body social. And you begin to get groups that are disaffected, like Spartacus. You get the Spartacus slave revolts, let's say. Or with the Ptolemies, you get the Egyptian fellaheen reacting against their overlords. Um, there are groups that begin breaking away and reacting, and eventually they will create a universal church. The Spartacus slave revolts are the prologue to the coming of Christianity from out of the slaves, and the slaves eventually create a universal church. This is Christianity, and the Toynbee calls this a chrysalis that forms within the body social of the Hellenic society and then breaks off from it to become a whole new civilization unto itself. The external proletariat, meanwhile, are the barbarian war bands who create the institution of uh, epos, the great epics, which then become the seed forms for future civilizations. As we have seen, all of Spengler's, uh, in his first stage, the springtime stage, always begins with barbarian epics, epics that have been created by barbarians from oral traditions, such as the Homeric epics, or the Scandinavian epics, or even the Gospels. They have all been created by external proletariats, although I think we could say the Gospels are created by an internal proletariat, not an external proletariat. Um, And that's what the, so these three groups create these three institutions, and then those are trying to be final three stages out of his seven stages, the, the universal state, the universal church, and the uh, barbarian war band with their epic uh, period. That's his model. He modifies it over time. And I think over time he begins to get more and more interested in religion and start to realize that the creation of a universal church may actually be the telos of all of these civilizations. He ends up seeing all of them creating a different kind of universal church that he thinks was the goal of the civilization all along, and that the universal state has to clear the stage in order for the universal church to function, just the way, let's say, Pompey's cleaning up of the Mediterranean, conquering all the pirates in the Mediterranean, cleared the stage for the wanderings of Paul and his Mediterranean wanderings. 
uh, so he could go through that process. So it's interesting how he's got this idea that the universal state creates a stable ecumeny, a clearing, a Heideggerian Lichtung, a clearing within which the universal state then can come that will then overcode the universal state with a whole new sign regime, a whole new set of semiotics that will take, will take it over. Now I think we can see that the riots that are going on right now are an example of a disaffected internal proletariat, uh, the black Africans, who are disaffected uh, with the dominant minority, uh, Trump and his regime, um, and they're completely disaffected and they want to secede from the body social, uh, and at some point they, they very likely will secede and create something new that might be equivalent to Toynbee's universal church. We don't know. There are other disaffected peoples, though, um, such as the if we think of R Ruby Ridge and Waco and uh, happenings like that, uh, there are other disaffected groups uh, that constitute internal proletariats that are completely disillusioned with the American government as a dominant, minor uh, a dominant minority and their leadership, uh, and they may break away as internal proletariats and form new societies. That's what internal proletariats eventually do, very often, not always, but they eventually form a new ecumeny, a new society, a new world order. So that may be what's happening. So anyhow, so there's Toynbee's model, and I think we need to keep it in our heads as we're going along here, because it has a lot of uh, aspects to it which can serve as correctives to Spengler. Uh, where Spengler misses certain things, Toynbee gets certain things right, Toynbee gets a lot wrong. I think he gets more wrong, actually, than Spengler does, uh, which is why I prefer Spengler, but they're both great. And so there's that.